this is a a pilgrimage that uh, five of us took uh, about a year ago. Uh, this this time, uh, two thousand nineteen. Um, it was it come. It, that culminated actually out of conversations we had uh, during and previous to a canal boat trip we took in France that I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but uh, we were all in agreement that we all wanted to go to uh, Vimy Ridge uh, and Dieppe, Juno, and Beaumont Hamill uh, flowed from that. And one thing I wrestled with when putting this presentation together was the use of the term pilgrimage or, or uh, defining us as pilgrims. Uh, I was unsure of that because, of course, when you think of pilgrimage, you think of religious um, connotations. Uh, so in always in doubt, you always figure out uh, what meanings are. You Google the uh, term pilgrimage, and I Googled it. I got a definition that I was quite happy with, and it basically said a pilgrimage is a journey often into an unknown or foreign place where a person goes in search through the pilgrimage, pilgrimage experience of new or expanded meanings about the self, others, nature, or higher good. It can lead to a personal transformation after which the pilgrim returns their daily life. That I thought nailed it pretty well because uh, all five of us, I think, were personally uh, influenced, touched, if you like, transformed uh, by this trip uh, to these uh, four uh, war memorial sites. Uh, in actual fact, uh, the 6,000 or so veterans that went to Vimy Ridge in 1936 for the opening of the uh, memorial described themselves as pilgrims. And even uh, Margaret uh, McMillan in her book, War, How Conflict Shaped Us, refers to people who, ref who uh, visit these memorials as pilgrims. So I was happy with that choice of words. And uh, I've invited Jenny to join us on this because uh, she and I made this presentation to the uh, Royal Hamilton Yacht Club Shellbacks uh, group last year. And uh, I got about halfway through it before I was in an emotional wreck. <laughs> uh, it, it was easy to tear up uh, on, uh, discussing some of these uh, sites. So I'm hoping Jenny can help me through this and also uh, uh, chip in uh, if she has any comments. What we looked at uh, were two World War I memorials, Vimy Ridge and Bowman Hamill, and two World War II memorials, Dieppe and Juneau Beach. And two of those were uh, successful battles, successful campaigns, and two were unmitigated disasters. And uh, one of each from the First World War and one of each from the uh, Second World War. Uh, there's a lot of ground to cover here in 60 minutes, so we'll probably have to move along pretty quickly. These are, this is our group after our canal boat trip. Uh, that's me and Zaw on the left, of course, uh, with the Royal Hamilton Yacht Club Burgi. That's Jenny and Steve uh, standing to my left with the Canadian flag and uh, Jenny's sister, Anne McEwen, uh, on the dock. Uh, this was taken at the end of our canal boat trip, which may end up being a future Shellbacks presentation, actually. Uh, and uh, we all determined, we all quickly found that we all had parents who had actively, had been actively involved in the Canadian forces in World War II. And in some cases, we had grandparents who were, and great uncles who were in service in World War I. And on top of that, I think we're all, I know we're all quite aware of the fact how privileged we were being born at the right time in the right place so that we didn't have to go through the trauma and turmoil that our parents and grandparents had to go through in two world wars and of course a great depression. So this visit to these Canadian uh, World War I and World War II memorials was a way not only to honor our own parents and grandparents, but also to acknowledge their contributions to creating a world in which uh, their children could thrive. So the area we're talking about is the north of France. Uh, our canal boat trip was, here's Paris here, our canal boat trip is down here south of Paris, and we picked this canal to be within easy driving distance of Vimy specifically. Our original canal boat trip, as Jenny will remember, was in the south of France, which meant like a 11 or 
13 hour drive up to Vimy. So he opted to uh, pick a canal that was closer to the north of uh, France. So after a canal boat trip, we jumped in our two cars and uh, drove up to Vimy, uh, then to Beaumont Hamel, then to Dieppe, and then to uh, uh, Juneau Beach. And I should add that both Vimy and Beaumont Hamel are Canadian National Historic Sites, the only two that exist outside Canada. And a Canadian National Historic Site has to be on Canadian property. And both Vimy and Beaumont Hamel were deeded to Canada by France uh, immediately after the uh, First World War. This is a uh, close up of that area. Uh, this is the town of Arras. And the battle that Vimy was part of it was called the Battle of Arras, by the way. And uh, it, uh, Vimy itself was only about 20 minutes north of Arras, and Beaumont Hamel's about 45 minutes south. And we spent our first night in, in Arras, having, having driven up uh, from south of Paris. We got there first. Uh, Jenny and Steve were a little late because they ended up trapped in Paris traffic for about two hours. Um, this is uh, Za and Anne in the downtown square of Arras. And this was the British headquarters for the uh, Battle of Arras Battle and Battle of Vimy Ridge. And it was 80% destroyed during the uh, First World War. So what you see here is primarily a rebuilt city. And that was the case in a lot of the cities we saw in Northern France. Sa and I went to Saint-Malo uh, after our tour of uh, the war memorials and we found out Saint-Malo was 80% destroyed during the war. We didn't get to Caen, but Caen was also actually uh, destroyed uh, during the war as well. So it's, it's remarkable to see these buildings, these uh, cities uh, rebuilt to their uh, former glory, essentially, uh, despite the destruction of the Second World War and the First World War in this case. Now the Vimy Memorial appears on the Canadian $20 bill quite prominently. The battle itself took place uh, between April 9th and the 12th on the, in, in 1917, which was coincidentally 50 years after Confederation. So there are people who uh, were knowledgeable about this battle uh, who were, could actually remember Canadian Confederation. It's, 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 you know, the fact that it is so significant, of course, is the reason the battle is so significant is the reason it appears on the $20 bill. And it didn't hurt, of course, the 50th anniversary of the battle occurred on the cent Canada's cent centennial year of 1967. Another sort of coincidence that adds to the uh, prominence of the uh, memorial. And that the 100th anniversary of the battle uh, occurred in 2017, which was Canada's sesquicentennial. Again, this overlapping of uh, celebrations. The memorial was opened in 1936, uh, obviously just prior to World War II, and thus it quickly actually got overpowered and fell in the sh overshadowed somewhat uh, by World War II itself and fell into some disrepair. And there's actually photographs of uh, Hitler uh, walking through the memorial uh, during the Second World War. So it wasn't until the 50th anniversary of the battle in, two, two, uh, in uh, 1967 that the monument actually rose to prominence again. And of course, the 75th and 100th anniversaries added to that. And so when we talk about the battle, we talk about the Western Front in 1917. This red line, of course, is the Western Front, and it stretched from the English Channel right to the Alps as the uh, Germans and the Allies tried to outflank each other all the way, uh, all through the war. Battle that took place April 9th to April 12th in 1917, and the significance of it, not only was it a great victory, but it was the first time that all four Canadian divisions made up of troops from all parts of Canada fought together as a cohesive formation under the command of a Canadian Major General, uh, Arthur Currie. And he came under the command of uh, the, the overall commander, Left Ge Lieutenant General Sir Julian Bing. The ridge itself, this is a uh, Vimy up here, uh, obviously in large version here, here's a RAS, here's the ridge. The ridge actually rises to the west, rises from the west and then falls off on the east. It's the highest point of land around there. The highest point actually is uh, 145 meters above sea level and is shown on the topographical maps as Hill 145 and it's on Hill 145 that the monument stands. The Canadians took over uh, that segment of the uh, of the Western Front from the British on October of 1916. 
Prior to that, the French had suffered 150,000 casualties in trying to take the rich. When you talk about the First World War, the level of casualties is just staggering. So the Canadians took it over in October. Uh, the attack itself began at 5.30 a.m. on Easter Monday, April 9th, 1917 lasted till the 12th and at the end of the on the 12th the Canadian Corps had firm control of the ridge. They suffered in that five days of fighting, four days of fighting, 10,600 casualties of which uh, almost 3,600 were killed and 7,000 wounded. Now historians attribute the success of the Canadian Corps to technical and tactical innovations this is the first time the creeping barrage had been used, used in artillery, meticulous planning, uh, powerful artillery support and extensive, and extensive training under the leadership of Curry and uh, Bing. This was the first time that it actually had dress rehearsals of the battle behind the lines. It was the first time they actually imparted to the enlisted men what the goals of the battle were. So they learned from experience that the first people to fall in battle are often the officers. And if they're gone, then the whole plan of the campaign is gone. So they trained everyone right down to the enlisted man uh, to what the goals were. Bing himself was so highly respected by the Canadian troops that he would, after the war, become the governor general of Canada in the 1920s. And he, his title was Viscount Bing of Vimy. So the battle itself was, it was instrumental in establishing Canadian identity, uh, certainly amongst the British, and, uh, and uh, led directly to uh, uh, autonomy of, of Canadian government. This is a photograph of the, of the memorial being opened in 1936. It, the whole thing started actually in 1922 when Canada concluded an agreement with France where France granted Canada free and for all time the use of 250 acres of land on Vimy Ridge, including Hill 145, in recognition of Canada's war effort. The memorial was designed by Toronto architect and sculptor Walter Allwood, who described it as a sermon against the futility of war. All would actually move to Paris himself in 1925 to supervise construction and the carving of the sculptures. The construction itself commenced in 1925 and took 11 years to complete at a cost back then of $1.5 million, which it creates to about $23 million in present uh, funds. The unveiling itself was conducted on the 26th of July in 1936 by King Edward VIII, and this was probably the most significant social public function that Edward VIII uh, performed before he abdicated the crown, you know, in, uh, for, the, uh, for the woman he loved. Uh, also present at the induction was the uh, president of France and a crowd of over 50,000 people, as you can see in this picture, including the 6,000 Canadian pilgrims, the Canadian veterans that attended the opening. The ceremony itself was broadcast live on uh, Canadian Radio Broadcasting Commission uh, over uh, shortwave. As I say, it's, it, the site consists of 250 acres, uh, much as, of which is forested or parts of the original battlefield, uh, which are off limits to ensure public safety. Um, the, there's still munitions, live munitions on that site. And they use the sheep, of course, to keep the grass down because you can't obviously get on, get on terrain like this to cut the grass. And of course, it's too dangerous to get on the train uh, for that purpose. And I mentioned before the Canadian National Vimy Memorial and the Bowman Hamill Newfoundland Memorial uh, are national historic sites and they comprise in themselves 80% of the conserved First World War battlefields in existence today. And between them, they receive over 1 million visitors per year. Here are four of, the, uh, of our pilgrims. The uh, fifth one, of course, is taking the picture. Uh, and this is the front of the monument. The monument itself is actually poured concrete. And it's faced with uh, this white marble called uh, Sagat limestone, which comes from a, an ancient Roman quarry uh, in Sagat, Croatia. Allwood himself searched long and hard to find the 
uh, uh, material that was white enough for the memorial and would retain its uh, whiteness uh, over uh, many years. The, it fell into disrepair during the Second World War, World War, of course, and was uh, restored and rededicated uh, in uh, April 9th, 9th of April in 2007, the 90th anniversary of the battle. And it was opened by Queen Elizabeth II, escorted by uh, Prince Philip. And uh, that time they figured they had about 30,000 people uh, present for that uh, ceremony. The centennial celebrations of the Battle of Vimy Ridge took place at the memorial on the 9th of April, 2017. Again, coincidentally, during the Canadian sesquicentennial. So again, these two events uh, coincided and, and, the, uh, and built on each other. Again, the estimates of the crowd for that were in the 30,000 range as well. Here's a shot of Jenny taking a picture of her husband, Steve, in front of the uh, memorial. Uh, that's the sarcophagus. Uh, that Steve's looking at. And towering over it, of course, is the, uh, the cloaked figure of a woman at twice full size. Uh, we'll talk about her in a, a bit in a minute. The front wall, which is normally mistaken for the rear, <laughs> is 24 foot high and it represents an impregnable wall of defense facing the German lines. The twin pylons rise 100 feet uh, above the stone platform, and one bears the uh, maple leaf of Canada and the other fleur de lis of France, and both symbolize the unity and the sacrifice. Oh, the, the, the sculptures of which there's one there, there's 20 oh, in total, and they're all double full size, uh, and they're all carved from, each one is carved from a single block of stone. Here's Steve looking at the sarcophagus. The one thing that impressed us all uh, at all these memorials is the number of personal uh, mementos left uh, to honor husbands, uh, brothers, uh, offspring uh, who died in battle. And the, the sarcophagus, of course, represents the fallen. And this is the primary focus of the uh, memorials, the uh, cloaked woman uh, standing at the top, facing east towards the uh, rising sun with the sarcophagus below her. She represents Canada bereft. Also known as Mother Canada. This was the uh, sculpture that they wanted to uh, replicate in, uh, I think in Nova Scotia, looking out over the sea. I'm not sure that's gone ahead. She, again, she was carved from a single block of stone by the uh, sculptors that uh, all would put together. The other thing to notice here, by the way, is when we first arrived, we saw these, what we thought were pyramids in the background. Uh, we had no idea what those were until we asked the guides. And those are actually slag heaps from coal mines. And the other reason Vimy was important, other than its tactical importance as the, the highest point of land around here, this was coal mining country. So anybody who possessed this land controlled the coal mines. And back in 1917, of course, uh, coal was a major uh, uh, strategic material. Another shot of... Uh, of Canada bereft facing east. This land, by the way, in front of the monument is the only cleared land uh, around the monument itself. Um, and it was called the amphitheater. And uh, uh, that was when the monument was opened in 1936, you could tell that was the focus uh, of, of where the audience was at that time. The uh, two more of the carved uh, statues of which there are 20. Uh, we didn't do enough homework before we got to Vimy to determine what the meaning of all these uh, sculptures were. And unfortunately, when we got to the um, visitor center, uh, we found out any book on the monument itself had long been sold out. So I, I really can't talk with any knowledge about uh, what these carvings represent. The um, the monument was extensively repaired uh, for the centennial celebrations uh, in 2017. Uh, with many damaged sections of the monument replaced. They say this is poured concrete with a facing of the Sagat uh, limestone and water would get behind the limestone, uh, freeze and thaw and crack the limestone and uh, several pieces had to be replaced uh, uh, before it could be uh, reopened again. Shots of the pylon uh, from, shot, you know, from the base of the monument. 
detail of some of the sculptures, which are just spectacular. The, the monument itself is 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 breathtaking. It's just beautiful. It's gorgeous. It's just gleaming white in this uh, background. And of course, everything around it is silence. Inscribed on the monument are the names of 11,285 Canadians killed in France, whose final resting place is unknown. You know, these aren't the names on the headstones in the cemeteries. These are names who, who do not have a headstone anywhere in a cemetery. No known grave. 11,285. And Rob, if I could interrupt, it's Jenny. Um, in all of these um, monuments that we went to, um, it was known that there would be remains um, in the fields around. And um, they had paths that you would walk on and you weren't to walk off them, not only because of munitions possibly being in the ground, but because it, it was a sanctuary. And people didn't talk when they were walking through these areas. Um, it was like being in a church. That's very accurate, Jenny. Um, it, was, it, was, it was, you know, when we talk about the effect it had on us, it was a very moving experience. Now, the inclusion of the names on the monument uh, was, uh, not a last minute thing, but Allwood himself was against it. He did not want his, his monument to be, uh, you know, uh, have all these names uh, inscribed on it. But he finally relented in the 1930s. And he actually end, ended up designing the uh, typeface uh, for all the names. And you can hear, see here in this particular uh, case, this is a section here that has been replaced. You can tell us it's a little whiter than the others. Uh, so it's a repaired area. Here we are again. Uh, this is the, the front of the monument. Uh, we found out later that, that these uh, reclining figures, one each side, are the, uh, the parents in mourning, uh, one male and one female, obviously. And uh, most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with uh, Jane Earhart's book, The Stone Carvers. And that, of course, focuses on the, uh, the design and building of the Vimy Memorial. And like every uh, memorial we visited in France, uh, the grounds were in immaculate uh, condition. Uh, they were just well cared for. Here we are walking back from the monument towards the parking lot. Uh, we actually went to the monument first because we got to the uh, Vimy uh, site fairly early in the morning and the visitor center hadn't opened yet. So we went to the monument first without going to the visitor center and then went back to the visitor center uh, after we had toured the uh, monument. And this is the visitor center. Uh, it's, um, it was actually started, previous to this, the visitor center had been a, a small house near the memorial, but uh, for the uh, centennial, uh, they decided to build a, a, a dedicated visitor center uh, and they started construction in November, 2015, and it continued it until official opening uh, on April of 2017 for the centennial. And the entire back wall of this, this is the front, that's the, this is the front entrance here, of course. Uh, and the back, entire back wall is glass and overlooks the uh, battlefield. This is a shot that I purloined from the website, actually, of the inside of the uh, visitor center. And it describes the battle, the significance of the battle, and highlights uh, individuals involved. Um, and it has a diorama of the battlefield as well. This is one display case that we saw. And what uh, Steve and I both noticed is it had this, uh, this knife on display uh, with a marlin spike and a single blade. And we both realized that both our parents, both our fathers had this knife in, uh, in their workshops. It was standard military issue uh, here in the First World War, obviously in the Second World War as well. So that, that just a little thing like that had a huge impact on us. Here we are uh, waiting for the guide to come and take us on a tour of the tunnels. This is a, by the flagpole. Timed entry. Yeah, we, it was a, we had a timed entry. Zaw's with me here now. Uh, we had a, a timed entry. You had to uh, sign up for a tour. Uh, so they only take about 20 people at a time. But uh, so the, our guide did come and she took us down into the tunnels. 
And what was amazing about Vimy, which I was not aware of before we got there, was the uh, amount of the extensive underground excavations that actually has started in uh, in this area back at the beginning of the war in, in uh, 1914 and 1915. The whole Arras Vimy sector is uh, made up of this soft, uh, porous, uh, but very stable chalk type material, which is perfect for tunneling. And they, you know, they tunnel under enemy, enemy lines, set off mines that blow up the, uh, the, the trenches on the other side, et cetera, et cetera. There was a very extensive underground uh, warfare at this time. There are 12 of these subways. They call them subways and they're up to three quarters of a mile long. And they're used to transport the troops from the reserve lines up to the front lines. And this was a lesson that they learned at uh, Beaumont Hamill. We'll discuss that when we get there. Um, but while the workmen were waiting around for the uh, white um, limestone to arrive to face the monument, uh, they realized the battlefield itself was starting to deteriorate. Uh, so they took the initiative themselves to actually start preserving the battlefield. The first thing they started to preserve were the tunnels. And they built these stairways to the tunnels and put in electric lighting. And then they looked at the trenches and started to notice the sandbags. The trenches were starting to rot and fall apart. So they replaced all the sandbags with uh, concrete uh, replicas. Uh, and all this happened in 1925, uh, realizing that what they had uh, was about to uh, disappear. And here we are with our guide in the tunnels. Uh, the tunnels that you're allowed to go through, of course, are uh, quite uh, safe and, you know, reinforced, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but the tunnel behind this uh, screen behind the guide here is uh, one of the original tunnels, and it's a much, much rougher shape than tunnels we were going through. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the uh, workmen who were doing the memorials uh, restored all these tunnels and made them suitable for, uh, for visitors. And I have to say it's going to come up several times but the the young people that fill this role of guides were just remarkable they're all bilingual university students they all applied for the job and were interviewed and trained by historians and I think their tenure was about nine months, right, Rob? I believe so, yeah. yeah. And then, then their training was quite extensive because they really knew what they were talking about. Yeah. Um, this is a section of the German trench at Vimy uh, that was, this is one of the trenches that was rebuilt uh, while they're waiting for the limestone, or for the uh, stone for the monument to arrive. This here, by the way, is a uh, machine gun uh, emplacement. Uh, covered machine gun place. This flag, by the way, is the flagpole that we uh, were standing by when we were waiting for the guide and the uh, visitor center is back here. Um, and here is a shot of that from the Canadian trench. So that's the German trench there. That's the machine gun emplacement we just saw. And so you could literally throw a stone uh, from the Canadian trench to the German trench. It was just uh, remarkable how close they were. And again, you couldn't go on that terrain. Um, I looked up some information um, while we were seeing all these pockmarked areas. And in the Western Front, um, a ton of explosives every square meter from the First World War. And one in three didn't detonate. And in 2013, um, they were still pulling, usually from farmers or excavations related to development, 160 tons of munitions um, still in this area. Yeah, and uh, which is one reason these are so well preserved. I mean, they're so well preserved because of the safety, uh, keep people off them. Uh, but um, they're, they are archaeological sites themselves. They're now 100 years old. Um, they're the only, the only preserved battlefields of World War I that exist today. Uh, when they actually built the visitor center, they treated it as an archeological site. And they, a lot of the uh, items they excavated during the uh, uh, building of the visitor center are actually on display in the center. And uh, if you go online, uh, there's a number of programs that uh, on YouTube that focus on excavation of uh, World War One battlefields, and there's a pro there's one program that's uh, available called Find 
Finding the Fallen. And there's a, a TV show, that one of the episodes focused on uh, Bowman Hamill specifically, and, uh, you know, the excavating of the, uh, of the trenches. And this is a plaque that uh, uh, just stands on the battlefield near the visitor center. It just says, this land is the free gift in per perpetuity of the French nation to the people of Canada. There are two uh, Commonwealth War Graves cemeteries on the Vimy site, uh, focusing on primarily British troops, British and Canadian, uh, and just in remarkable condition. All the uh, cemeteries we saw had the same uh, cross and sword uh, motif on them. Uh, it was the common throughout all uh, Commonwealth War Grave cemeteries. This uh, is a particularly moving headstone. It's uh, FDH, 54th Battalion Canadian Infantry, died 9th April, 1917, first day of the battle, age 16. I mean, the number of child soldiers involved in the First World War was amazing. My own grandfather tried to enlist at the age of 16, and his, his uh, mother intervened. A lot of these headstones, you see most of the headstones have the regiment insignia on the headstone. Uh, a lot of them, two of them here and two of them here, just have a cross. And it's uh, just it states a soldier of the great war known unto God. You know, so his, these names may well be on the Vimy Memorial. We got out of the uh, visitor center. We did, did uh, the Vimy Memorial about, I guess we came out around noon. We had lunch on the tailgate of Stephen Jenny's van. And we looked at our watches and said, uh, you know, our next stop was supposed to be Dieppe. And that was only about two hours away. And we had most of the day left. And when we'd been in the, in the visitor center, we discussed um, other sites with the guides. And they said, well, you have to go to Beaumont Hamel. Uh, it's, it's just 45 minutes away. So we, that was our plan. We hopped in the uh, vehicles, uh, put Bowman Hamel into our GPS, and we uh, drove down there. Uh, in, it was a drizzly, cold, damp, miserable day. Uh, but we all realized, so we would never be this way again. So if we didn't do this now, we uh, uh, probably uh, wouldn't, would, ever, would never do it again. And we arrived there. I say it was uh, rainy and dr uh, drizzly. Um, and this is a Newfoundland uh, memorial. And but you've got to remember, of course, in the First and Second World War, Newfoundland was not part of Canada. Uh, they entered Confederation in 1949. It was a separate dominion in its own right. And of course, one of the reasons it entered Canada, uh, it became part of Confederation, was the devastation that the war, both the First World War specifically, uh, uh, you know, inflicted on Newfoundland because a lot, huge loss of uh, lives of many young men who would become, you know, who were supposed to become leaders of Newfoundland, and they just weren't there anymore. It's a 74 acre site, preserved battlefield park. Uh, it encompasses the ground over which the Newfoundland regiment made their unsuc unsuccessful attack on the 1st of July, 1916. So this battlefield actually predates Bimby. And the 1st of July, 1916, of course, was the first day of the Battle of the Somme. And it was the first major engagement of the Newfoundland regiment. Uh, and during the 30 minutes that the regiment were in action, they basically were wiped out. The first day of the Somme, first day of the Battle of the Somme was the deadliest day in British military history. There were 58,000 casualties, over 19,000 deaths. And all of that occurred probably within the first two hours of the battle. The battle would drag on for another four months. It was just horrendous slaughter. Uh, the site itself was acquired in 1921 by the people of Newfoundland, again, donated by the French government. And it's the largest battalion memorial on the Western Front. It's the largest area of the Somme battlefield that's being preserved. And 
in addition to the Newfoundland Memorial, of course, there's uh, other battalion memorials uh, on site as well. And this is just a slide I got offline of, uh, of uh, the area around Bowman Hamill uh, uh, during the First World War. And the, the reason for the disaster at Bowman Hamill uh, was because of what, the fog of war. The commanding officers had no idea what was happening at the front. This happened at Dieppe as well. And they thought there'd been a breakthrough. They sent in the reserves, which was were the uh, Newfoundland Regiment. And uh, there was no breakthrough. And uh, they were just cut down uh, with machine gun fire. Uh, it was a major mistake, a major error. Uh, the, the actual advance had been stalled and actually pushed back. The Newfoundlanders, Newfound Newfound which had to get from the reserve strength, uh, uh, reserve strength trenches to the front line through what they called the communication trenches. The communication trenches were already clogged with dead and wounded. So the Newfoundlanders had to literally stand up, get outside the trench, stand up on the battlefield, uh, to walk forward. At that point, they were the only troops standing on the battlefield, and they were just mowed down by machine gun fire. Most got as far as the danger tree, that's this tree here, a reproduction of it, uh, which was a landmark on the battlefield. Uh, the Germans and the uh, British and Canadians used it uh, as a landmark, and the uh, the Newfoundlanders were told to gather there uh, and uh, then advance into enemy lines. The enemy lines were up under these trees here. Uh, of course, because it was a well-known landmark, the German artillery just zeroed in on it and the majority of casualties occurred under the danger tree here. Uh, this, they say, is a replica and the path that goes around the whole uh, site goes right by it. And over here, you can see another uh, uh, Commonwealth War Grave Cemetery. I think there's three of them on this site. This is the shot of the uh, reserve trenches. And all the trenches were in this zigzag configuration because they realized early in the war that straight trenches uh, were su suicidal. If the enemy, enemy took over a straight trench, all they had to do was straight, shoot right down the uh, tre trench. So they started to zigzag the trenches to make them uh, more secure. So on the 1st of July, 1916, as far as it can be ascertained, 22 officers and 758 other ranks were directly involved in the advance from this trench. Of all of those, all the officers and slightly over 658 other ranks became casualties. Of the 78, 780 men who went forward, only 68 were available the next morning to answer roll call. This is a, a casualty rate of 80%. As I say, it was the first day of the Battle of Somme. It was a drop in the bucket compared to the uh, 19,000 people uh, that were killed just on the, in the British side uh, on that day. And again, the, uh, all the grounds around there are maintained by sheep. Our guide, uh, who was, I think it was her first day as a guide, were explain, as was explaining the battle, and then halfway through her uh, talk, she looked up and said, oh, sheep. <laughs> and uh, uh, and they're, they're everywhere. They, just, they maintain the uh, grounds. Another shot of the uh, trenches, again, the zigzag configuration. And uh, as I say, this is the... Uh, one of the few preserved World War I battlefields uh, that suddenly exist. Uh, during the day, we actually heard the sound of pipes. Uh, and we turned around and there's this young piper uh, walking down the path towards us. And he was followed by this other group of pipers. And where they were coming from was the Scottish Memorial uh, that's uh, also on the battlefield. And this memorial, uh, this actually is in, commemorates the uh, 51st Division uh, Scottish Highland uh, Regiment, which were on the front lines of the battle. And they were completely decimated in that first day of battle as well. As well. Uh, this uh, monument was actually uh, commemorated, opened by Field Marshal Folk, uh, Folk in uh, 1924, uh, dedicated to the Scottish Regiment. We continued to walk around the uh, site, and as Jenny said, you can see these, the uh, the path is well defined. You cannot walk off it. 
uh, for safety reasons. And these, again, the preserved trenches, the zigzag pattern of the preserved trenches. And then in the background, of course, here's the famous uh, uh, Newfoundland uh, monument, which is right there. And learn from my experience, never refer to this as an elk. <laughs> uh, when I asked the uh, guides at the visitor center, where do we see the elk? She uh, glared at me and said, never call it an elk to a Newfoundlander. It's a caribou. Uh, and it's the uh, battalion emblem for the Newfoundland uh, regiment. The site itself was opened by Field Marshal Haig on the 7th of June in 1925. And uh, the elk stands on a solid block of granite uh, imported from Newfoundland. And the sculptor of the elk, of which there are five reproductions, by the way, is a British sculptor, Basil Gatto. Uh, and there's one of these, I think, that exists in uh, St. John's as well. But it's a caribou, not an elk. Uh, this is the site of the, uh, of the caribou. You can see them up here on the granite. All this all this is uh, native uh, Newfoundland um, vegetation and, and plants. And there are three bronze plaques at the base of the, uh, of the monument. Uh, the largest one is to the 820 members of the Royal Newfoundland Regiment. The smaller ones are for the Newfoundland uh, Royal Naval Reserve and the Mercant Newfoundland Merc Mercantile Marine. Uh, all of whom are who gave their lives in the First World War and have no known grave. And this whole, this phrase, no known grave, uh, is used a lot. This is a close-up of all the names of the Newfoundland Regiment that lost their lives at Bowman Hamill. And I think during the whole First World War. Um, one thing to note, of course, July 1st in Canada is Canada Day. It's a, it's a time of celebration of Confederation. July 1st in Newfoundland is Memorial Day. It's, um, it's where they mourn their uh, war losses. One interesting book about the Bowman Hamill uh, campaign and the, and the Newfoundland Regiment generally, of course, is a book called Into the Blizzard, written by uh, Michael Winter. It describes the whole history of the Newfoundland Regiment and focuses on Bowman Hamill, Hamill of course. And the title Into the Blizzard uh, is how somebody described the regiment going forward in battle. They put one shoulder down as though they're walking into a, a snowstorm. Uh, and in actual fact, they're walking into machine gun fire, of course. And the uh, cite the um, uh, Commonwealth war, uh, war Graves cemeteries are exceptionally well maintained. And here are three headstones that represent six burials. Each one of these headstones represents two uh, individuals. And here's the Newfoundland uh, Caribou, of course, the uh, uh, symbol of the regiment, and one Newfoundlander here, and one uh, a Brit, I believe, here as well. So once we got, uh, once we we're finished with uh, the Bowman Hamill uh, Memorial, probably late in the afternoon, we hopped in the cars and drove to Dieppe and got there after uh, dark, I think it was. I checked in the hotel, looking for a restaurant, some place to eat, and they they directed us to a seafood restaurant, which was right in here. Um, and we, we walked down the street and we actually, they were, they were fully booked up and uh, had no tables available. And they basically apologized and said they couldn't sit us, seat us. And so we we're standing outside wondering what to do next when the maitre d' came back in. <laughs> came back out and uh, brought us in and gave us tables on the outside uh, near the, the uh, near the pool actually down here uh, with electric heaters uh, to keep us warm and we had an excellent meal but um, what I found out afterwards is this location where this restaurant was was the site of the old casino of Dieppe, where a lot of the fighting with the uh, Royal Hamilton Light Infantry, infantry took place. And uh, if I had known that at the time, I think I would have been uh, yeah, quite uh, moving. So here's our 
our itinerary. We did Vimy, we did Bowman Hamill, we drove to uh, Dieppe, which is on the obviously on the English Channel. It's an old uh, resort town, and of course we would go to uh, Juno Beach uh, after that. And the Battle of Dieppe is uh, very um, important to Hamiltonians, of course, because the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry landed there. Um, this is a plaque that appeared that was at Canada Park in Dieppe, and uh, it reads, and I have trouble getting through this. On August 19th, 1942, in one of the darkest hours of the Second World War, Four thousand nine hundred sixty three soldiers okay, my turn on August nineteenth nineteen forty two <clears throat> in one of the darkest hours of the second world war, four thousand nine hundred and sixty three soldiers of the second Canadian division with air and naval support set sail for Dieppe, Puy, and Pourville and the waiting guns of the Nazi occupying forces. This was the first large scale allied military operation that looked forward to the liberation of France. The battle was brief and bloody. 807 Canadians perished in combat and 1,946 were made prisoners of war and only 2,210 soldiers returned to England. I, I, want, I, I sometimes wonder how, why I get so emotional about this. Because um, I wasn't there. But I had a father who enlisted at the age of 18. Fought, fought all through Italy and Holland during the war with the Governor General's Horse Guards. And he was the same age as the majority of the names on these headstones. These headstones, all male, all young in their early 20s. And you know, it could have been your father. And of course, when you have sons of your own, it even makes it more poignant. But anyway, the, the Royal Hamilton Infantry landed at White Beach. Uh, the Essex Scottish landed at Red Beach and they were just mauled badly. Um, the Calgary tanks landed here as well, and the uh, Fusiliers to Mount Royal were the reserves, and they were sent in uh, by mistake as well. This third the British commandos landed up here, and the Saskatchewan uh, uh, regiment landed here at, at Green Beach, South Saskatchewan, and the Queen's Own Camer Cameroons. Uh, so of the 6,000 troops that were involved, almost 5,000 were Canadian. The rest were British commandos, U.S. Rangers, and Free French. It was a raid, not an invasion. They're supposed to be in and out in the same day. And, you know, you scratch your head and say, what the hell was the purpose of this? Uh, why such a great loss of life for such a meaningless uh, escapade? Uh, you know, the modern theory now is that they were actually going after... Um, uh, uh, what's break. A, a code breaking machine for the you know the Germans? What's that thing called? A, uh, uh, I, I can't remember. Um, Enigma. Enigma machine. Yeah, uh, that people are now disputing whether that was the case or not. But uh, the uh, that would at least give some credence to, for the rationale of this raid. There, uh, there are three Victoria Crosses awarded at uh, Dieppe. Uh, one to a British commando and two to, to Canadians, uh, one to uh, Reverend John Weir Foot of the uh, uh, Royal Hamilton Light Infantry and the armory in Hamilton is named after 
uh, Major Foote, and a other one to Colonel Charles Merritt of the South Saskatchewan Regiment. But it was, uh, it, you know, keep in mind that, you know, that when I, when I say that 800 and uh, some odd uh, dead from this uh, raid, keep that number in mind when we talk about Juneau Beach. The uh, town is dominated by the uh, Chateau, uh, uh, which we went and visited. And, so, and that photo of the, of the town in the first opening photograph was taken from the Chateau. Uh, and and uh, this high ground over the town was one of the reasons the, uh, uh, the troops are so exposed. The, um, this is Canada Park beneath the Chateau. I was impressed, I was amazed at how uh, many memorials there were to the Canadians in Dieppe. If the battle has not been forgotten. This is Canada Park. This is the where the plaque uh, hung, where that I, I mentioned earlier. Um, they, they, there's a close connection between Dieppe and Canada. This is a, a, a an inscription on the wall, uh, basically referring to the 1942. Uh, attack on Dieppe and referring to our, our Canadian cousins. Uh, again, the closeness between Dieppe and Canada is quite amazing. This is Anne looking at a memorial that celebrates every connection between Dieppe and Canada going back to Jacques Cartier. And uh, anytime a Canadian prime minister visits Dieppe, uh, it's inscribed on this uh, panel when uh, uh, Harper was here uh, I guess for the centennial uh, celebrations, his visit is inscribed on this uh, on this column. Another memorial to uh, the prisoners of war. Uh, very soon, you know, very uh, appropriate since so many Canadians were taken prisoner of war at Dieppe. Uh, the chains here em em emblematic of uh, prisoners. The beach at Dieppe looking towards the uh, highlands. Um, and it's a, a stone beach, something I'll get into uh, in, in a minute. And here's another shot looking the other way. And the other thing to look, notice in this shot is the uh, pier. This is the entrance to the harbor. Uh, it's quite a large harbor. Uh, and, you know, strategically important. Uh, and one reason. One reason that they claim is a reason for the attack on Dieppe was to see if they could capture a port uh, in order to uh, ease the um, logistics of an invasion. But again, the pebble beach, not pebble beach, it's a stone beach. I picked up a stone off, off the beach and brought it home. It's quite a large stone. Um, and here that same beach is in 1942. And that's the pier in the background back here. And uh, the I think they had uh, a large number of Churchill tanks uh, with the Calgary tank uh, land on the beach, uh, armored cars. And, the, and the, uh, one of the reasons for the um, disaster at Dieppe was, was the tanks were late. The tanks didn't get there on time. The tanks, the, the, all the training for Dieppe involved the infantry uh, marching in behind tanks and the tanks clearing the way. Without the tanks, the infantry was completely exposed. Uh, same thing happened at uh, Juneau Beach and same thing happened at Omaha. The tanks were late. Um, so of the 5,000 strong Canadian contingent, uh, uh, over 3,000, 3,400 almost were killed, wounded or taken prisoner, uh, you know, and a 68% casualty rate. Uh, of the 1,000 British commandos, 247 uh, lost their lives. The, the Navy lost a destroyer. Uh, 16 destroyers involved. They lost one. They lost 33 landing craft. And the amazing statistic for me was the RAF lost 106 aircraft. This is after the Battle of Britain. The RAF lost 106 aircraft to 48 uh, lost the Luftwaffe. Uh, so in all respects, this is a complete unmitigated disaster. And, uh, you know, much like uh, Bowman Hamill, you scratch your head and say, uh, you know, could this have been aborted? The answer, obviously, the answer is yes. But like Bowman Hamill, the lessons learned there were applied to um, uh, Vimy, the success, success at Vimy. And you could quite easily argue that the lessons learned at Dieppe uh, were applied to uh, the Normandy landings. 
again the shot of the uh, the town from the uh, uh, chateau above. Uh, same shot that I opened with, actually. With but you can, it, yeah. yeah, you can see how exposed the beaches were uh, to this uh, high ground uh, where there were gun emplacements or there were uh, pillboxes. Uh, that's the beach again. And this is an observation post, a German observation post. They had complete control of the beach. And there's high ground over here as well that uh, uh, covered the beach over here. You know, the Scottish, uh, Essex Scottish landed here. Royal Hamilton Light Infantry landed here. The casino was here. Uh, they were just cut to bits. Uh, Steve and Zah, just uh, a sense of scale for the, uh, for the beach. And this is a pillbox right at the uh, this road here. You walk down that road, the uh, chateau is down there. You walk down the road to the uh, cliff, and there's this German uh, gun emplacement sitting right there. And the view from the gun emplacement is that the whole beach is exposed. Uh, it's just they didn't stand a chance. You know, they they couldn't get above, couldn't get over this uh, this esplanade through here uh, into town. And the ones that few that got into town. Uh, couldn't get any further. The tanks couldn't get up there at all. And, uh, and that, that was one of the uh, mistakes of the battle. The few back that did get in the town reported that they were in town. Uh, Major Roberts, the commanding officer and the destroyer offshore, thought they had made a breakthrough. He sent in the reserves, the uh, uh, Mount uh, Royal Fusiliers, and they just got cut to pieces as well. Uh, again, shot along the beach with the high there's the chateau there and the high ground there uh over the beach the that gun emplacement i was talking about was right about there so next morning uh ann and i it was drizzling rain set off to have a look at the um uh individual uh battalion uh, memorials along the beach. Jan, Jenny and Zah were, were having gastrointestinal problems that morning, so they stayed in bed, and uh, Steve, being a dutiful husband, stayed back to take care of Jenny. So uh, Anne and I uh, knew we would never be back here again, most likely, so we set off to explore the Esplanade, starting from the, uh, the canal side, uh, walking westward. And the first uh, memorial you run into is the Essex Scottish Regiment. Now, this is Red Beach. Um, as I mentioned, they uh, were badly mauled. Of the 553 members of the regiment, only 51 got evacuated back to England. And at the um, uh, Dieppe Museum, which is a private museum that we went to uh, a little later in the day, I ran into a fellow whose uncle had been one of the uh, uh, SS Scottish casualties uh, on... Uh, on uh, at Dieppe. Oops, wrong way. And the amazing thing about this memorial is that it was designed by a young 18 year old art student at the University of Windsor, a guy named Rory O'Connell. And it's an amazing uh, memorial because this is a reflective shield and with a maple leaf cut out. And the maple leaf that's cut out is, be, is set in the uh, pavement here. And every, every August 19th, the anniversary of the battle, uh, the sun reflects off this uh, shield and at 1 p.m. lights up this uh, maple leaf. Wow. And this is a dedication that says, dedicated to the Essex Scottish Regiment Canada, to the memory of their comrades who gave their lives in World War II during the raid on Dieppe in August 19, 1942, and during the Allied advance through France, Belgium, Holland, and Germany, 1944 to 45, on the road to uh, victory. And this is Anne standing in front of the memorial to the um, Calgary Tank Regiment, uh, just down the esplanade from uh, the uh, Essex Scottish uh, Memorial. And they have an engraved photograph of a Churchill tank with stones being spewed up from the treads. Because one thing they found after they landed is the tanks had zero traction on the beach because of these stones. They used to just throw the stones up and not make any headway at all. So tanks were uh, virtually useless. And further down the beach is the memorial to the uh, Montreal, uh, the Mount Royal uh, Fusiliers, which the reserves unit that was sent in, again, the fog of war, they thought the battle was going well, sent in the reserves, and uh, they were just uh, cut down on the beach as well. And even further down uh, on uh, White Beach, I guess, is the uh, memorial to the 
uh, Royal Hamilton Light Infantry. Uh, this, this was an interesting experience. And I think uh, Jenny can remember. Oh, Jenny wasn't here. Jenny was sick in bed. Uh, but when I, Anne and I were here, uh, we, were, we were standing here next to the memorial. And these two cyclists came up to these uh, young guys, I guess in their 40s, uh, you know, with their bicycle helmets on and their spandex uh, shorts and everything else and their uh, souped up uh, bicycles and they asked if we were Canadians and we said yeah I said well he said you know we're from Guernsey we're, we live on Guernsey and then we're just taking this bike tour of northern France uh, this is the first time we'd ever heard of uh, this this battle at Dieppe and we don't we knew nothing about it uh, and he said he was impressed but how um, how much the town had done uh, to commemorate the battle. Again, just a memorial to the, uh, to the, to the, to the Rileys, the uh, RHLI. And above the town uh, is the cemetery for Dieppe. Uh, like a lot of the uh, Commonwealth War Graves cemeteries, it's in, it's an open field. It's in farmers' farmers' fields, basically. Uh, but the difference about this cemetery compared to all the others is the way it's laid out. Um, it's the only Commonwealth War Graves cemetery that's laid out with the headstones back to back, because that's the way the Germans laid it out. When the Germans buried the Canadian dead, they buried them in the uh, German manner back to back. And so the uh, War Plane, War Graves Heritage Commission decided not to disturb the graves and just to replace the headstones with uh, uh, Commonwealth, heads, Commonwealth War Graves headstones. And that's the way it remains today. And, you know, as I mentioned before, the uh, number of commemorations that people leave. You know, walking the, uh, the site, just viewing the headstones. All, you know, Royal Hamilton Light, Light Infantry, Royal Hamilton Light Infantry. And another one, a soldier you know, a soldier of the, of the war, basically, uh, an unidentified body. They knew he was Canadian, but they didn't know who he was. Uh, very thick. But you got to remember, Dieppe is still an active and vital town, and it's got this huge marina. Uh, you go through the uh, canal uh, into the harbor, and back here, they actually have a lock. The commercial uh, harbor is back there, and there's a lock that uh, keeps water level at, this, at the same level. This is the title, of course, and all these boats can quite easily cruise to England, or Brits can cruise to uh, Dieppe. And it's also got a history beyond the, uh, the 1942 battle because uh, William the Conqueror, his fleet left from Dieppe in uh, 11 whatever, was the Battle of Hastings, 1066, uh, to uh, conquer England. He left from Dieppe. So this is a very old town. So the next step, not next stop after we finished Dieppe, of course, was to uh, get to Juneau. And uh, which was D-Day, of course, in the Canadian beach at Juneau. Uh, we, uh, we did get to Bayeux to look at the tapestry. We didn't get to Caen, unfortunately, which I to this day, day regret. Uh, but we did get to the Juneau Memorial. Uh, later on uh, in the week, we did get to Omaha Beach, uh, Point uh, but and to the, uh, the old Mulberry Harbor. At, uh, at Amarosh, which was about here, uh, but that's far, far too much stuff to cover in this presentation. Um, Juno Beach, our hotel was in Corselle-sur-Mer. Uh, my French is not very good, and Vernier-sur-Mer is where the uh, where the Canadian landings took place. The, the cemetery we visited was in Vernier-sur-Mer Ber up here, that's out of town. And the Canadians, of course, were the um, uh, the, the landing that got us further inland than any other landing on D-Day. Uh, but interestingly to note, they also had the highest rate of casualties next to Omaha Beach. Uh, Juneau Beach next to Omaha had the highest rate of casualties. Uh, 
Uh, and the reason they suffered the high rate of casualties was the same reason that the uh, Americans suffered casualties at Omaha, and the same reason that the uh, uh, Canadians suffered casualties at Dieppe. The tanks were late getting there. The tanks arrived after the infantry. But on D-Day, on Juneau Beach, on a single day, uh, 574 men of the 3rd Canadian Division were wounded and uh, 340 were killed. Now compare that to Dieppe. At Dieppe, 807 Canadians perished in combat. Uh, so the lessons learned at Dieppe, you could quite successfully argue, had been applied to D-Day. The casualties weren't nearly as high for the Canadians. The Americans, of course, had very high casualties. Um, so, uh, as I say, if, if you could ascribe any advantage or purpose to Dieppe, uh, that may have been uh, one of them. Oops. This is our uh, hotel uh, in uh, Corsair, <laughs> and one thing you notice over here is this memorial, and uh, when you get to it, we find it's a more memorial to the uh, Winnipeg uh, Rifles, who landed on this beach in, in uh, uh, June 6, 1944. And again, the memorial, you know, the in individual uh, remembrances. This was built on the uh, 50th anniversary uh, uh, of D-Day. It's, it's, it says D-Day plus 50 years up here uh, in, in to, as a remembrance for the uh, uh, Winnipeg Rifles. And again, individual personal remembrances. These are three brothers that fought on D-Day. One didn't come home. And he walked further down the beach and we ran into this Sherman duplex tank sitting there uh, with this historical plaque there and, um, and a maple leaf in the garden here. And it turns out that's Jenny and Ann taking a picture and saw there in front of it. Uh, it turns out when we walked further down the beach, we saw this kiosk in memory of uh, uh, Leo Garapi. Uh, he landed on this beach in this town, Corsell sur mer with the Canadian Army Regiment, the first Hazars on D-Day. Uh, at the time, he was 32 years old, which was quite an old man for uh, that, that kind of thing. But after the war, he actually packed up and moved from Quebec to corsel sur mer and became a prominent citizen of the town. Uh, and in 1972, he organized the recovery of a lost Sherman duplex tank. A, a duplex tank, by the way, has propellers that could actually float uh, with a, an apron around it and uh, propel itself through the water until it got to the beach and then in, uh, gauge the treads. Um, and he salvaged this tank and put it on display in honor of all the Canadian regiments who took part in the Normandy, la Normandy landings uh, or following D-Day as uh, supporting troops. And on the uh, side of the tank is the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry. Uh, Royal Hamilton Light Infantry did not uh, land on D-Day in day one. They wanted to spare them another uh, disaster that happened on Dieppe. So they landed uh, several days after Dieppe, uh, sorry, after D-Day and uh, took part in the Battle of for Khan, uh, which actually cost more lives than the uh, D-Day invasion uh, did. This is a, uh, uh, a, a tourist plaque, a tourist map of the uh, site of the Canadian uh, Visitor Center, which is there. This is the marina. This is the pier and the entrance into the town. Um, this bridge is interesting. This bridge is only uh, open at low tide when boats can't get by. At high tide, they close this bridge. So when we walked from our hotel down here past the fish markets and got to this bridge and waited, uh, and, waited and waited, the bridge was closed. Uh, and we found the, the uh, bridge operators here and we finally were able to communicate him, he, with him. He didn't speak any English and our French was not that good that the bridge would not be open for a long time until the uh, tide came in. Uh, or actually till the tide came out uh, so they could, uh, you know, there's no traffic at low tide. So we walked all the way around here, all the way around here, and we uh, walked across over this bridge here and then walked over to the uh, visitor center here, the, uh, uh, the museum. And this is what it looked like on D-Day. Uh, this is the, where the marinas are. This is the bridge that we ended up crossing over. Uh, the other bridge was down here and this is the channel. Uh, to the ocean. And you can see the landing craft 
here on the beaches. You can see uh, military vehicles on the beaches and the um, the visitor center, the uh, memorial is here uh, for D-Day. And this is what it looks like. Uh, this is a picture I took um, of the Juneau, uh, Canada. It's a Second World War Museum. It's not a D-Day Museum. It's a Second World War Museum. It's uh, it uh, bears um, and honors all services and all battles of the Second World War in which Canadians took part. Uh, it uh, pays homage to 45,000 Canadians who lost their lives during the war, um, of which 5,500 were killed during the Battle of Normandy and 359 on D-Day. It was opened in 2003 by the veterans and volunteers with a vision to create a permanent memorial to all Can Canadians who served during the Second War. Um, it's a it's preserved the legacy and for future generations through education and uh, remembrance. And I have to say it's extremely well done. Here's a shot of it from the air. It's supposed to, I think, resemble a maple leaf. I'm not sure about that, but each segment uh, has, uh, is devoted to a specific uh, part of the uh, Second World War. Uh, you actually enter the, uh, you know, you pay, you pay your ticket in the, uh, vestibule and you actually enter the museum through a simulated landing craft as though you're on D-Day uh, with aircraft flying overhead and sound of uh, bombs and uh, machine gun fires and the doors open the ramp goes down and you walk into the museum and the first thing you see is what Canada was like in, in the 1930s uh, before the Second World War and then it goes through the whole buildup of the war and, uh, and again it's extremely well done. And I just took some of these, these are some of the pictures I took of the museum and some I uh, downloaded offline. Uh, but it's just, uh, it's, it's, if you get a chance, you really need to go there. The, um, the naval part of the museum was uh, of great personal interest is on myself uh, because it, it, uh, it focused on a, a Corvette, HMCS Trillium. Of course, Zaw and I own a CNC Corvette called Trillium. Uh, so this, uh, I thought this was a, an amazing coincidence <laughs> that, that uh, affected us quite uh, deeply. Um, this is another photo I downloaded offline from the website and it shows the guides uh, that, uh, that man these um, memorials. And they're just extraordinary young people. This is our guide here. And this is her uh, with, our, with her tour. And we're about to enter uh, German bunkers on the beaches of D-Day. Uh, she explained to us that she's a Japanese Canadian and uh, her grandparents, and she lives on the, on the West Coast in Vancouver. Her grandparents were interred for the duration of the Second World War. She wrote her PhD thesis, thesis on the, uh, in history on the Japanese internment. Uh, so when she volunteered for this uh, guide position uh, as a uh, interpreter for the for the D-Day Memorial, uh, she said it exposed her to a whole different side of the war that she was not uh, previously that knowledgeable about. And it really widened into her perspective, she said. Um, and it was... It was quite moving when she said... that it occurred to all the guides that they were the same age as the young men who landed on this beach. Stephen, Jenny, and Zah, uh, taking pictures just before our tour. And there's our guide explaining the significance of the, uh, of the bunkers and Basically, what she explained to us, she said, you know, these these bunkers were manned year round, starting, you know, when they built the when Rub Rubble built the Atlantic Wall uh, throughout the war, and uh, she and she said, you know, think that you're the German High Command. Would you commit your 
frontline troops, your highly trained frontline troops to this duty, just to sit here in these bunkers and watch to see if the uh, the invasion was coming. And I said, no, he said, the, the, these are the people that man these bunkers who tended to be uh, very young or very old. And uh, they were there basically just to sound the alarm uh, if anything was going to happen. And the French, um, this is Jenny again, the French um, had to build some of those bunkers. Um, and labor, yeah. yeah, and uh, towards the end, they were actually sabotaging the construction of them so that they wouldn't be the solid concrete um, that uh, the original ones were. We heard that story as well. Exactly. Uh, it was all forced labor, forced uh, French labor and, and, and forced uh, Eastern European labor. And, uh, and she pointed out areas that were obviously uh, poor construction, uh, which they attributed to specific, definite sabotage uh, on behalf of the uh, workers. Uh, because again, you can imagine the people overseeing them weren't all that uh, knowledgeable as well. Uh, frontline people. Uh, another bunker. And obviously uh, experienced some shell damage, Steve giving a sense of scale. Uh, there's a historical plaque up there that he's reading, I'm not sure what it said. And like Dieppe, Corsel sur mer is a yachting town. Uh, once you, this is at a high tide uh, where the bridge would be open and you get in there and there's a uh, quite a active yachting population. The tides, the height of the tides were amazing. This is Steve and Jenny standing up. Well, this is the bridge that we couldn't cross uh, at high tide. Uh, but of course, at low tide, uh, ships can't, boats can't get in and out. So they let, they open the, open the bridge to let, for pedestrian traffic. Uh, local fishing fleet, uh, the fishing market was quite ac uh, active. Uh, but the tides, got to be like 20 feet of tide there. I was quite, uh, quite shocked. This was a... A hotel restaurant where we had lunch our first day uh, in uh, Corcel uh, sur Mer, and it's right across, literally across the channel from the uh, the visitor center, uh, the World War II um, exhibit, and we had our last dinner there as well, uh, two days later, and we're sitting there uh, at the table. Uh, discussing what we're going to order, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, it's basically uh, their local neighborhood pub, I think, because uh, there's a bar there as well. And um, sitting at the bar was an older gentleman. And he was obviously, I think it was about five o'clock, so he was probably dropping in there for a beer before we went home. And he came over to our table uh, as he was leaving, and he asked if we were Canadians. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and we said yes and he asked if um rob or steve had served um in in the in, in the second world war um they said no but um, <laughs> each of us had parents who had served in the second world war and uh we, we all started to get very emotional as he thanked us for being Canadian and for the service that our parents did. And that was the first time that happened to us. And the second time was uh, when we were in the hotel when we were leaving. Uh, Rob and Saul weren't there, but uh, Steve and Ann were. And it was a young man who was in his early 20s who went through the same conversation and thanked us for giving him the life that he now has. So it was, it was it, lots of emotions. To this day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so our, our last stop on this tour of uh, of uh, Canadian war memorials it was a visit to the uh, Bene uh, sur Mer Canadian uh, War Cemetery. Um, it again immaculately maintained. Uh, the cemetery contains the graves of the from the Third Canadian Division uh, who fought 
at D-Day and the Battle of Caen. There's 15 airmen who were killed during the Battle of Normandy buried here as well. Uh, there are three British graves and one French grave. Is, so, so there's about 2,000, well, there are 2,048 markers in this cemetery. Most of them, as I say, were killed uh, in July 1944 at the Battle of Caen. Uh, it also contains the remains of the Canadian soldiers who fell at D-Day uh, in Juneau Beach and some prisoners of war, uh, specifically the uh, ones that were executed at the Ardennes Abbey by uh, the uh, uh, SS, uh, um, Kurt Myers SS specifically. Uh, they're buried there as well, as well as the grave of the Reverend Honorable Captain Walter Leslie Brown who was the only um, uh, the only chaplain who was actually murdered by the SS uh, during the uh, Second World War. That's uh, we found. I found, saw his story at the uh, D-Day at the Canadian uh, Second World War uh, memorial at Juneau Beach. They had a long story about him, which I won't go into now. Um, but there's the Benny Saint Sumer grave you know, uh, cemetery there, and just uh, was a short distance from Corsell de Mer. And like all uh, Canadian war, play, war um, uh, cemeteries, the land on which the cemetery stands, the gift of the French people. That's it. I say 2,000 headstones, 2,000 very young men. The uh, common cross and sword, all Commonwealth war graves uh, cemeteries. This is a Royal Hamlin Light Infantry, uh, died 17th July, 1944. So this is a, a month and a half or so after D-Day, uh, obviously for the battle for Khan. Uh, that's where they put the uh, Hamlet, Royal Hamlin Light, Light Infantry back into the battle. This is the headstone for the Reverend Brown, uh, the chaplain who was murdered by the SS. And the thing that we all noticed was the, all the Jewish headstones uh, had stones piled on top of them. And we, to this day, I don't know the significance of that, uh, but it seems to be a Jewish custom. And this young man was uh, in the Hazar, so he's in, in armor, obviously, and he died at the age of 21. Um, June 11th, 1944, so after the D-Day landings. Again, we, you know, the um, one comment that Jenny made earlier was how quiet uh, all these memorials were when we were there. Um, Jenny, tell the story about the guy with the uh, the drone. Oh, that was at um, uh, the uh, Newfoundland Memorial. Yeah. Um, so this fellow had a drone and it started to fly it um, up above the grounds and security went after him um, immediately um, because this was sacred grounds. Nobody takes pictures from above like that. You can take pictures from the ground, but uh, that was um, out that he, he wasn't evicted. He, he did apologize and he just didn't know. Um, yes. Yeah, and, and, and I say he, it, well, it wasn't a confrontation at all. The uh, the caretaker suggested he not do that, and and he agreed immediately not to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here we are at the end of our uh, trip, all five of us together in one photograph, <laughs> um, and I think we all agreed it was a, a phenomenal experience. Uh, we had seven days in the French canals, uh, but we all agreed that the six days at Vimy, Beaumont, Hamilton, Dieppe, and uh, Juneau did, and lead, did indeed lead to personal transformations, certainly in, in me. Um, you know, there's a strong feeling of pride and gratitude that what Canada achieved, uh, but it was tempered by a deep sense of sorrow, uh, grief, and, uh, and a good deal of anger, actually. Uh, the poor planning and ineptitude involved at Bowman Hamill and Dieppe. 
Uh, and generally, the, you have to scratch your head about the collective insanity of World War I generally. Uh, what was all that about? Uh, it just seemed to be a huge loss of life. So at this point, uh, we split up. Uh, Steve, Jenny, and Anne headed back to Paris to fly home. They only had two weeks off. They were still working back then. And Zah and I spent another uh, week, uh, went to St. Malo and uh, Dinan and Chartres and Paris and uh, did some more traveling. Uh, but um, uh, that was the end of our time in, in the north of France at the war memorials. And we all agreed it was uh, definitely an experience well worth having. So, and I apologize for my emotion, but uh, it... Uh, don't, don't apologize for your emotion ever. Um, I would just like to thank you so much, Rob. That was uh, an education, uh, an emotional education. I think my eyes filled with tears many times. Uh, Probably as much as anything is that my husband Charles landed on D-Day on at uh, Corsair sur Mer, and uh, he had a hard time talking about it. He landed in the second wave, and I know were he here today, he would have been sitting beside me blubbering just as you were. Um, and as usual, you were so well prepared and so detailed. And so I'd just like to uh, ask everyone just to give Rob uh, a big round of uh, silent applause because that's all we can do right now. But much, much appreciated, Rob. Well, well done. Thank you, thank you. And coming up next week, we have um, Fred Rom who's going to be talking about uh, his trip on a canal uh, boat in the UK uh, along the, he went on a trip with um, Craig and Michelle Franklin and his wife Dahlia, who by the way is an author and has written a, a wonderful mystery. And so he'll be next week. And upcoming after that, we have Mel Melody Schaffer returning uh, with two legs of the Southern Ocean, Ocean Clipper race and also her plans for her next adventure. So thank you everyone for being here today. We will have uh, breakout rooms afterwards. And with that, pipes out. May I get a quick question? Uh, sure. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't give you any time for questions or responses. Yes, of course, Jim. Um, these memorials are a tribute to the people who have died in their bravery and country. But being an evolutionist, I wonder if humans will stop having wars. And this is really a, an evolution of one tribe fighting against another from evolutionist viewpoint. And I was just wondering, Rob, if you had any perspective now or feeling that humans might be able to replace warfare by more um, non-destructive means such as super uh, negotiations. Very interesting question. It's one reason I, when it became available, I rushed out to buy Margaret McMillan's recent book, War, How Conflict Shaped Us, um, see what her perspective would be. And uh, and she's not optimistic <laughs> because uh, she's optimistic about some things. I mean, uh, uh, she talks about the growth of na nation states, et cetera, et cetera, and how war has become so industrialized. Uh, and and what the First World War and the Second World War proved is, is how costly wars can be. I mean, if you're going to analyze it from a purely rational point of view, war makes no sense at all. Uh, it destroys both, you know, the winner and the and the loser are both losers in the long run. Um, but she quite accurately points out that even after the Second World War, even though we've been in this sort of period of peace, uh, there's been more uh, regional conflicts than have ever existed before. 
so you ha don't have world wars, but you have civil wars all over the place and you have uh, uh, local aggression and you still have conflict. Um, so she's, she's quite convinced that uh, war will never disappear. Uh, but she, I think, somewhat optimistic that there probably won't be another world war to the extent of uh, World War I, World War II. Would you put that reference, give that citation to Diane to put on the, on her emails? Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, on the bestseller list right now, but in the U.S. and Canada for that matter. Um, and she wrote the uh, Paris nineteen nineteen uh, book and uh, another recent book about World War One, I, I think. Um, she's an exceptionally good writer. I mean, I, I read the book and didn't come away with any real answers. I was looking for answers and uh, they're not in the book, uh, but she does describe all aspects of the psychology of war. I mean, uh, I, uh, it amazed me at Bowman Hamill, what it would take. Uh, and this is something that, that uh, gets addressed in the book, um, uh, Into the Blizzard. Uh, what is bravery? bravery? I mean, is, is it brave to actually stand up out of a trench onto the open ground to be mowed down by machine gun fire, is that brave? Or is it brave to stay in the trench and say getting out of here is, is uh, suicidal? And she talks about what motivates soldiers in war, uh, why they do go into those situations. And it's to a large extent, um, it's uh, fear of being uh, fear of being afraid, fear of being embarrassed. Uh, you'll, you know, when you're with your comrades, you don't want to be uh, be perceived as less than they are. Uh, so, if there are any more questions, she, what follow-up question? Did she say anything about religious beliefs being a reason for warfare, as happens in the Middle East these days? That's one question. And the second question is the replacement of sport as sport as a replacement for warfare. Well, she discusses sport not so much as a replacement for warfare as a training for warfare. Um, because she talked about before the First World War specifically, uh, you know, the, on the playing fields of Eton, uh, play up, play up, and play the game. Uh, all these sports analogies were uh, used uh, for military service. And so she talks about that. And as far as religion is concerned, she does talk about the Iraq-Iran uh, war, uh, where the Ayatollahs on both sides told the troops they would become instant martyrs um, if they died and go to wherever they go. And so, yeah, she does talk about the uh, influence of religion on soldiers. Uh, but basically, when she said, when it comes right down to it, uh, Soldiers are motivated by the people, more people by the people around them than by uh, lofty uh, goals of democracy and freedom. Uh, if anybody, we have a few more questions. If you have a question, please uh, raise your, virtually raise your hand and we'll follow you in order. Uh, next, Elspeth has a question. I don't actually have a question. It was your comments about the people that stopped and asked if you were Canadian. Twice, once in Amsterdam and once in Brussels on a, an excursion, the first thing the tour guide asked, are there any Canadians on board? And boy, did that piss off the Americans. <laughs> <laughs> and one of them was quite interesting. I think it was Brussels. They said, we are now passing the Buffalo Bridge. We all went, Buffalo? They said, it's named after the patch of a Canadian division hmm. that yeah. helped free the city. Uh, okay. That was my uh, comment. Okay, uh, Julia, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Robert. I knew none of the Canadian side of the history of those areas in France. So I, and I cried a bit too. Um, my heart is still breaking for all of that. I've been spending a lot of time working for peace since I've been in Canada, um, one of the things that's just happening right now is that <clears throat> the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons has now been verified by 50 countries 
And in 90 days or a bit less than that now, probably, it's going into, um, into action to remove nuclear weapons. Now, of course, there are two sides to the coin and that in, is a huge discussion, but um, the weapons these days are a hundred times more stronger than the ones they dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the reason that um, the conference, there's a conference coming up with Voice of Women um, where they're wondering why Canada hasn't signed on. I'd be very interested if any of you know any of that, that side of the Canadian history as to whether they still think that MAD works, and I don't mean the women's group, I mean mutually assured destruction, and maybe you can fill me in some other time, the longer discussion. It but is. I'd like also to discuss um, possibly going, I've been to several of them, right across the border of Canada and the US, we have all these peace gardens or peace bridges or peace something established mainly because US and Canada have not been at major war the whole right across in the 45, I think it was 19. Hmm. might have been 1945-ish time, um, particularly the International Waterton Glacier Peace Park, which is there because of the animals living in that area around the huge lake to be able to allow them to cross over and back to their places. Anyway, um, that was the question was, you know, does anybody know anything about the peace parks? to celebrate our countries not being at war. I know we've had the, was it 1814 war? 1812. Yeah, that I might be that. a good topic for an, another speaker, Julia, to bring us some on that. Yeah, they're, they're obviously up there, they're to celebrate the undefended border, obviously, I think. And mm -hmm. Probably <laughs> the sentiment dates back to the War of 1812, I guess. <laughs> okay, is there, we'll take one more question. If anybody has a question, please uh, virtually raise your hand. We have two more here, uh, Christopher and, and Liz. Uh, they haven't raised their hand yet, so. You need to raise your hand on the, on the uh, Zoom, uh, not, by, not physically, but on the Zoom. You press chat, no, not and chat. then there's a raised hand there. Yeah. The participants. Yeah, participants following the slide that was up there, because we're following, we're giving them in that order. Right. Were there any others that were had? Uh... Nobody else has their hand. Nobody else virtually raised their hand. Well, Christopher's no. got his hand no, no, physically yeah. raised. Okay, we've got a couple physically. So, uh, how about Christopher? You go ahead, and then Liz. It needs. He needs to unmute himself. Unmute yourself, Chris. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. I was in the British Army of the Rhine after the war, and I had tremendous, uh, what's the word, consideration given to me in Holland and also France and Belgium by people who, are, who appreciated North America's participation. But what I wanted to mention was on DF. Um, Churchill was faced with strategic decisions. Uh, one was on bombing of Coventry, which he knew about through Enigma, and he had to keep quiet. And the second was Diep. Um, Russia said, do something. And Churchill said, we have not ready for the Western Front. And Russia said, for heaven's sake, do something. And so Diep was strategically two purposes. One is a trial for Normandy, obviously, and two is to direct the uh, Germans away from the idea of Normandy towards a, a landing further north. Right. Right. The two things were vital. Um, and 
so Dieppe wasn't a total disaster from that point of view. It served also as a training ground and whatnot. But strategically, it was very, very important from that point of view. Last year, when I was on the beaches of Normandy, I had my back to the sea and I looked along the beach. Now, have any of you seen Private Ryan and all those movies and all the fighting all around you? Imagine that for five kilometers. I just gasped. I couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. Seen the movies, maybe a hundred a hundred yards. In the real life, it was off and on, and you could see the pillboxes up on the hill with crossfire. It's, I don't know how anybody got across those beaches. It's yeah. absolutely incredible. Um, in London, my cousin started uh, the Soldiers Museum, I guess, and and there they show you what battle is like with the noise, the flashes, and so on. And it's huge, it's just really, really frightening. But coming back to Dieppe, um, it was a disaster, obviously. Decision was made for two, for support Russia and to has a trial run. So it wasn't, a, from that point of view, it served its purpose well and those lives weren't wasted. So, thank you. Okay, uh, Liz, uh, go ahead, unmute yourself for our last question or comments. Yes, it's just, it's a, an idea because this is all about world wars, but I believe right now we are in a world war. It's called the COVID pandemic. And uh -huh. I'm looking to the optimistically to how the world comes together in solving uh, this dire problem together and it may bring the globe closer together. Well, well, I hope you're right on that. Look at it. And, that, and I think it's something to ponder. That will depend on who's president of the United States, I would think. <laughs> oh, we know who is. <laughs> we know who know. is. And... <laughs> yes. Well, thank you, everybody. I'm sorry. I apologize for forgetting about the Q&A, but we did get it in, and we will have... Uh, I don't know, Graham, how long you have to hold uh, us we have to... A, about we have about for 10, in, 10 to 15 minutes. 10 to 15 minutes breakout rooms afterwards. And with that, I will say pipes out.